Hello, I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the next in our series of conversations with Giants in Medicine. Today, we're joined by Dr. Lloyd Hollingsworth Smith, Jr., known to most of his friends as Holly. Dr. Smith's research originally centered on pyrimidine synthesis and the rare disorders of hereditary erotic aciduria, which provided one of the earliest demonstrations of an enzyme defect leading to a specific disease. But he's more acknowledged for having led the University of California, San Francisco Department of Internal Medicine for 21 years between 1964 and 1985, where upon his arrival, he quickly set about raising standards in patient care, teaching, and research. Hopefully we can learn a little bit about his visionary leadership from our conversation today. Can you tell me a little bit about your beginnings in science and the schools you went to in your upbringing? Yes, I can start all the way back, uh, growing up in a small town in South Carolina. Um, this was, of course, during the Depression. My grandfather had been the town doctor there, although I never knew him. He died before I was uh, born, actually. Uh, my father had been a uh, lawyer and a cotton farmer. Uh, <clears throat> so I went to the public schools in Easley, South Carolina. Um, perhaps the bigger influence on me was my uh, uncle, Uncle Hugh Hollingsworth Smith, who had also come out of this uh, small town and uh, went to medical school at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he went on to have a very interesting career. After clinical training, he went to the uh, Rockefeller Institute, where he was involved in developing the first vaccine against uh, yellow fever. Uh, working with uh, Max Tyler, who later won the Nobel Prize for this uh, work, the vaccine still used. And he took it to Central and South America and proved its effectiveness, much like Aerosmith in that famous uh, novel. So he was a uh, remote and dramatic uh, figure for us uh, growing up. I think that's one of the reasons that I chose to go into medicine. So after um, public school, a uh, rather limited public school, 11 grades. Um, I went to Washington and Lee in Virginia. Um, at that time, it was not a particularly good school. It's been improved since, remarkably, the, um, because it's begun to admit women. There were no <laughs> women at that time, and in fact, no minorities. Um, but Joe Goldstein went there, and Mac Harvey, uh, and Robert Williams, uh, all recipients for the Cobra Medal from the Association of American Physicians. The remarkable thing was that the Pearl Harbor happened when I was a freshman, and this remarkably altered the career and uh, aspirations of all of us at that age. I was uh, 17 at the time. We were quickly, uh, later that year, taken into uniform and told if um, we could be admitted to medical school, uh, the Army, or Navy in my case, would send you to whichever institution you were admitted to. Now, my career there was quite truncated, of course, just uh, two years. Um, Two things stand out. I was on the wrestling team, but unfortunately, I was known as Canvasback Smith. I was not a great uh, success, although I won a, a varsity letter in, in wrestling. And I found myself uh, preaching in the mountains of Virginia uh, as uh, president of the Christian Council. I, I can't believe that I had the nerve to go back there at age 17 and 18 and preach to the mountaineers about the sins of liquor and fornication and things like that. <clears throat> Fortunately, there's no recorded record of what I had the nerve to say at that time. Um, <clears throat> so I applied to three medical schools. Um, those days were quite different. Um, Harvard and um, uh, Johns Hopkins and Penn, all very good. And was admitted to these three without an interview because of the war, the difficulties and so forth and decided to go to Harvard Med, just otherwise I would have gone to Johns Hopkins, better known in the South. 
But I went to Harvard Med in part because my older brother was admitted there as well as a two-year transfer student from North Carolina. So in the cold, dark January of, uh, of uh, 1944, I found myself getting off the train in Boston. First time I've been north of uh, New York City in uniform and starting medical school. Well, <clears throat> I was 19 at Harvard Med, but that was true of most of our classmates. We were the youngest uh, class ever admitted there because of the war and not because of smarts. So when you got to Boston, how did you approach medical school? With fear and trepidation <clears throat> because of um, very poor background, being quite young, uh, not very sophisticated, not having a strong training in uh, science, and facing high competition among Ivy League individuals. In fact, my three partners on the, uh, in anatomy were from uh, Harvard, uh, Yale, and Princeton, which seemed intimidating. In medical school, we were certainly being, finally being taught by people who asked questions and not just read answers out of other people's uh, textbooks. And that was intriguing, so I took on a uh, elective uh, research op opportunity and with a fellow classmate, we studied uh, the heart-lung preparation to study cardiovascular physiology in the second year. <clears throat> and that stimulated my interest in doing something in science. So at the end of the third year, the, uh, our, the war was over and we were dismissed from being in uniform. So I decided to take a year off and spend it in physiology as a, as a student uh, fellow to learn something more in depth about science. We've been rushed through uh, so quickly. We didn't have a chance to stop and think and consider. Now, do you think you <clears throat> date your real interest in scientific lab research to that period? Yes, I think that was a beginning. We had a full, I had a full year in the Department of Physiology I didn't do anything very fundamental, but at least we stopped and thought about things and wrote some papers on exercise, uh, physiology, and uh, things like pain thresholds and reactive hyperemia. So then I came back to the senior year of medical school, uh, refreshed. In the meanwhile, I had <clears throat> moved from Vanderbilt Hall into the, this is amusing, New England Home for Little Wanderers <clears throat> there actually is an, a, an institution near Harvard Medical School. I was the, the doctor living in the Home for Little Wanderers. I did that for 20 half years to earn my key. <clears throat> so in the senior year of medical school, I took an elective with uh, uh, Dr. George Thorne worked in his laboratory for a while. And he was a very interesting thing. They were setting up the first American trials with the artificial kidney. The artificial kidney had been uh, created in its current version in Holland during World War II by someone named Dr. Kolff, K-O-L-F-F. -F. Um, Dr. Thorne had heard about this <coughs> and he had one <coughs> constructed uh, in Massachusetts and delivered to the Brigham Hospital. And some unnamed Dr. George, I mean, uh, uh, John Merrill and I were assigned to make the darn thing work. Well, <coughs> we had to start from scratch. The artificial kidney at that time was a large revolving drum around which something like sausage casing was wrapped and had a big tank of about a hundred liters <clears throat> that you had to, to dialyze against. Well, there were no dialysis uh, solutions. So we had to start with a yellow pad and figure out, you know, how much uh, potassium, how much sodium, how much, uh, we would weigh it out and dump it in, and pour water in and mix it with a stick. That was our dialysis fluid. 
And, <clears throat> but the most amusing thing, we didn't have pumps to get the blood back to the uh, patient. So you take blood out of an artery, the pressure of the artery, it would uh, be carried up to a reservoir, and then flow by gravity back into a vein. This was acute dialysis. Didn't have a pump, had to make a pump out of an old refrigerator pump. And um, we didn't have non wettable substances to suck the blood into and send it back. Now, people don't believe this, but it's true. We hit upon using condoms. And I, as the youngest member of the team, was sent weekly down to Joe Sparrow's drugstore to buy the condoms. A gross of condoms. A at gross a time. of condoms. And they'd say, here he comes again. I was never held in such high repute as during those uh, few months. Well, we actually did carry out the dialysis. There's a picture in the Boston Globe of standing around the big old dialysis uh, machine with uh, Dr. Thorne and Merrill and myself and his medical student in the spring of uh, 1948. Well, that was. Interesting experience. So, after graduation, um, I went to the uh, Mass General for an internship and first year of uh, residency. And that was a <clears throat> very intense experience, like internships are. We, uh, most of the interns were single. We lived in the hospital, didn't have any place outside the hospital. We were paid $25 a month plus maintenance. If, uh, if you wanted to go out on a date, you could sell a pint of blood and get $25 and double your income. The Mass General actually discussed charging tuition for their interns because they had so many applicants. Um, my, the fellow intern that I've kept most closely in touch with is, was James B. Weingarten, later director of the NIH and a very close friend, and later chair of the department at Duke. We've been close friends since. We were fellow interns during that time. At the end of this, um, knowing I wanted to learn more about science, I was uh, selected to be in a very interesting organization called the Harvard Society of Fellows. It still exists. It was set up in the 1930s. And they choose about six people a year uh, and give you a spot in the university and a modest salary. And you have the free run of the university. Um, you have one duty, and that's to appear every Monday night in a special dining room in Elliott House and have done it. Um, first there's, uh, of course, a little sherry and a fine dinner, and then the port is passed around. And there are no speeches. You're supposed to sit there and converse. And an extraordinarily interesting group of people, uh, senior fellows and the other junior fellows, and then I sat by J. Robert Oppenheimer one night and talked with him. But anyhow, I started that, and then the um, army caught me again. Only fair, because I had escaped World War II when many of my friends had gone. In fact, fraternity brothers had been killed in the war. So, and you went to the Korean War. That's right. So I got pulled in and first was sent to Walter Reed because I'd had some background in research. We worked on hepatitis and uh, liver disease and some genetic disorders. and But then there was a um, surgical research team, so-called, that was sent to Korea to ascertain the problems of the wounded. So I went along and I found out, perhaps not surprisingly, that uh, a number of those most desperately wounded had been uh, dying of kidney failure, potassium poisoning. And the kidneys were shut down because of shock and old blood that had been given, and they were dying. And you managed to convince them to bring in the artificial kidney. Yes. I um, called back to Washington and told the colonel there that I would like to come back and get an artificial kidney and give it its first trial. So 
I did. I come, came back and brought it over, and we set up a center, kidney center, in one Jew in there in a tent hospital. And the wounded who needed that kind of care were brought in by helicopter. And we did that for some months. And then um, came back, got out of the Army. Where did you land after your time in Korea? Well, I went back to Walter Reed for a while you, uh, to get uh, to complete your military service. And then went back to Harvard and picked up that fellowship and spent a year in organic chemistry at, uh, at Harvard University. And then I spent a year in New York uh, studying uh, biochemistry with uh, the late Hans Stetten, who was using isotopes in metabolic pathways as a pioneer. And that was a uh, very fortuitous that I was there because uh, my wife-to-be came back from the Middle East and we took up again and uh, got married. Now, let me explain why she was there and where I met her. Her, her brother was one of my classmates. And she was a Wellesley grad, and so it, that connection seemed natural. And then she uh, got recruited by the CIA, and she was a spy in the Middle East. Uh, seems very unspy-like when you meet her. You know, maybe that was the genius of the CIA. So she, she didn't stick out in the Middle East. Well, she was ostensibly uh, a member of the State Department, and. But lurked around over there for three years. I, I used that verb lurk. I'm not sure she was. We're going into Damascus and Jerusalem on the Arab side and all these things. Anyhow, back she came and we re met and uh, got married during that year. <clears throat> so at the end of that year, uh, we went to Sweden. I spent a year at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And um, that was a wonderful experience. I was uh, studying biochemistry as applied to metabolic pathways, in particular pyrimidine metabolism. In fact, our first child was born in, in Stockholm, a daughter who is now vice chair of, uh, a member of the Young Turks and the vice chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington. Um, so I came back from there and I was supposed to be chief resident at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I was rusty as hell. I'd been two years in the Army and three years in chemistry, and to go back and be the top trainee at the MGH. So fortunately, the, the chief at uh, Walter Bauer at the Mass General realized this, as did I, and he arranged with the late, great Robert Lurb, you may have heard that name, at Columbia for me to be de-rusted. They use that phrase. I didn't object because it was true. So I spent three, uh, uh, six months in Columbia being de-rusted. Um, I met people like Paul Marx and Helen Rennie and other people who were young folks at that time. So then I came up, we moved up to Boston and uh, started the chief residency. Now that was quite an experience. The, um, the Mass General at that time was an arrogant darn place, it probably still is. It had the kind of the top young people from the country uh, coming there and beating on the doors to get in. And in that year that I was chief resident, I thought that saying that uh, Wellington supposedly said at the Battle of uh, Waterloo, as he looked at the English troops drawn up. He said, I don't know what they do to the French, but by God, they scare the hell out of me. And <clears throat> so my fellow interns and residents scared the hell out of me. We had on there people whose subsequent career was president of Merck Pharmaceuticals, Roy Vangelis, for example, future president of the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, John Knowles, future director of the Beth Israel, Mitchell Rabkin, about three members of the National Academy, uh, five department chairs, two further chief residents, 
and the winner of the Pulitzer Prize on this small house staff of 28 people. I want to skip ahead a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got recruited to UCSF and what your reactions were to how medicine was done on the West Coast as opposed to the MGH model? So uh, a year and a half after I was chief resident, uh, Walter Bauer, who was a very dominant figure at the Mass General in those days, he called me in his office and said, I'm going to make you chief of endocrinology. He actually did. And, uh, and then he said, I think you can make it in academic medicine. But if you don't, I'm going to kick you out of here. I'll give you five years. But I thought it was a supporting proposition. So I set up in the endocrine unit. And we had a number of very bright, capable young people who had gone on and done big things in medicine. Uh, but um, and then Bauer died. Uh, he had chronic uh, pulmonary disease from smoking too much. And so he died. And so, surprisingly, I was one of the candidates internally to succeed him, although I was assistant professor at that point. And, well, they didn't choose me. I think wisely, they um, chose Robert uh, Ebert, who later became dean at Harvard a few years later. And that seemed very logical. So I went over to um, Oxford and uh, spent a year with Sir Hans Krebs. Uh, I don't know how much science you know, but the Krebs cycle and uh, a great figure, Nobel Prize winner. And then <clears throat> while there, I suppose because of having presented some papers at Atlantic City and so forth, um, I got asked to come out and look at the chairmanship at uh, UCSF. So I flew out there in the spring of 64. I'd just turned 40. And uh, much to this, my surprise, they offered me the job right then. And I said, yes, I accept. So how did you set about transforming the department then? First, I would like to come in on what I found there. The uh, UCSF School of Medicine is the oldest one west, west of the Mississippi. It's older than Johns Hopkins. The first uh, president, Johns Hopkins, came from the University of California. Um, but it had the first century um, was not particularly distinguished. So when I came in and looked at it to try to decide whether this was worthwhile doing, you could look at it in two ways. One, you could look at under oil immersion, and you could see imperfections, missed opportunities, languor, uh, malignant complacency, or you could back off and look under low dry, and you could see in the broader picture that it was associated with a great public university. Berkeley already was a tremendous center for science. It had been Lawrence Oppenheimer, Nobel Prize winners. Good support of public education. Clark Kerr, president of the university. Things were booming in California. So you just had to say, am I going to take a chance or not? And, um, a lot of things were coming together. Stanford had left San Francisco and moved down the peninsula. Its medical school used to be there. Um, and then IH was in its ascendancy. The jet engine had been introduced into air travel, which was important, five hours rather than 10 hours from the coast. So I said, oh gee, this is going to be opportunity. I was quite uh, comfortable at Harvard and didn't feel unloved there. But decided, well, why not go out and take a chance? So I arrived there and uh, tried to take stock of what existed. Um, someone explained the tenure system to me. And after he explained it some length, he says, I can summarize it for you briefly. While there's death, there's hope. So that was a little chilling, you hear that? 
Um, the Department of Medicine had uh, one member of the Association of American Physicians. My coming doubled the number there. Um, didn't have many research grants. I had only 50 people. Now it has 550 people. It's separate hospitals, not unattached. So anyhow, there was so much to do. Uh, it's hard to know where to begin. First you had to show the flag, kind of tighten things up, uh, increase the number of teaching sessions, be visible, um, critical, need be. Try to work out who had talent and who did not. And you had to recruit a fairly large number you of people. You had to recruit a fair number of people and find out the means for doing so. And uh, recruiting on a national level, not just who was uh, comfortable and local. Um, note the difference between A plus and A minus, which is a huge difference. And working with the talent that did exist there. So we started out trying to improve the clinical activities in general, not just in the Department of Medicine. We recruited in uh, new chairs from uh, uh, pediatrics and neurology and other clinical services and radiology. The new head of surgery was uh, came from Harvard, uh, <coughs> Dunphy, whom I'd known as a professor at Harvard when I was a student. So he was a great ally. So it was so accretion, and probably the uh, probably the best thing I did early on was to. Um, chair of the search committee for biochemistry. And uh, I was able to uh, recruit uh, Bill Rutter, who was a, many people will now know who it is, and Gordon Tompkins. So these two, two people turned around the, the basic science uh, departments. There is, there is a book that was just published a few months ago about the um, background for innovation, pointing out the remarkable fact that at UCSF between the late 60s and most in the 70s, lapping over the 80s, within a hundred yards physically, three of the great discoveries in biomedicine occurred. Uh, recombinant DNA, the basic patent was held there in Stanford. Genentech spun out of uh, UCSF, Herbert Boyer. Oncogenes, Bishop and Varmus, and prions, infectious and proteins. Tracer. So two of these three won Nobel Prizes, and it came out of the basic science departments. So this book examines the dynamics of how that occurred. It's a very interesting book. So did you encourage Harold Varmus to take on the role at the NIH? No, I did not encourage him to do that. He was a splendid uh, scientist, as everyone knows, and the record shows. But when he was offered it, I actually went and spoke to him and said, Harold, don't do this. Uh, you're going to be a failure. You're going to be unhappy. Uh, you're not a diplomat. You're a splendid scientist. Stay here and be loved and continue your unique contributions. Of course, he just smiled at me and denied my advice and went back and did first-rate administrative responsibility there, as we all know. I've laughed about it many times since. You can't hit them all. Even, even Willie Mays hit one in three and got in the Hall of Fame, so you, uh, you miss sometimes. Now, speaking of governmental roles, you also served on President Nixon's Presidential Scientific Advisory Committee. What was that like? Well, it was odd. Um, I was not a, a Republican, and I'm not quite sure how I got appointed. But the PSAC, as it was called in those days, uh, would meet about eight times a year in the executive office building. and. Um, it had two charges. What should the government do to advance science? But more important, what science could do to advance government p policy? Now this was during the Vietnam War. And the P 
PSAC was dominated by physicists and engineers, appropriately. So I would sit there in awe, listening to Nobel Prize level physicists talk about how to um, uh, track the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, the computerized battlefield, how we could follow the Russian submarines, I mean, literally, this sort of thing. And we would occasionally get into a few things on biomedicine, but not so much. And then I did talk to Nixon on the war on cancer, one-on-one, on one. met with him. I've, uh, I've hidden that photograph I have of it, but he was a very smart guy, actually. And he laid a fire to solve because we, uh, we, most of the physicists, we gave him some advice he didn't like. But it was an interesting sociological event. Now, I mean, speaking of interesting people to work with, you also worked with the Shah of Iran, who was trying to establish an academic medical center in Tehran. I can imagine that also must have been some interesting conversation. Well, I have to, I, I like to tell the joke sometimes. I work with uh, three of the most uh, problematic people of our time, uh, Richard Nixon, the Shah, and Howard Hughes. Now, um, working with the Shah, that's an exaggeration. I had spent, I'd been to Iran uh, three times and had been over there uh, teaching in Shiraz. Well, I'll tell you how it came about. It was kind of amusing. Um, I got a notice that the Minister of Science and Higher Education from Iran was coming to San Francisco to see me. Well, I went home and bragged to my wife, I must be getting well known here, you know. So I went down to the hotel and out came this dapper Persian surrounded by an entourage. So I was and said, hi, Holly. I said, my God, who is that? Well, it was his, uh, his Excellency, um, Minister of Science and Higher Education. I'd known him as Chuck. He'd been a fellow at the Mass General years before. So he got me involved over there. And uh, later they set up a, uh, a commission to advise the Shah on developing a new imperial medical school. Um, this was right before the Shah fell. We, we went over, Bob Ebert was on the committee, uh, many other leaders in academic work. We went over, we met just for the Shah and very formal. We weren't sitting around now and saying, Shah, what do you think about this or that, you know? Well, it was interesting sociological. I'm very um, fond of Iran and the Iranians that I know. I just hope you've got the good sense not to bomb them. Right. Anyhow, that's a little political aside. Now, you mentioned uh, your role working mm -hmm. with Howard Hughes. So you served as chairman of their medical advisory committee, and you succeeded your former mentor, George Thorne. That was an interesting responsibility. Uh, a pleasure. Uh, I started back in the uh, early 70s when it was a very small outfit. The whole budget was about uh, uh, four or five million dollars a year for the whole HHMI. And it was closely held. Um, if you were on the board, then you got some slots to, at your institution. And it was pr pretty much a uh, Harvard Hopkins, uh, Duke, Vanderbilt, uh, Seattle, and then I guess I got on and got some slots for UCSF. But only spending a very small amount. The IRS was chewing on the Hughes people that weren't spending enough. They owned the Hughes Aircraft Company, but no one knew just what it was worth. So, um, I remember getting a telephone call where it's come to Washington, we've got to double the budget, literally. So I hopped on the plane, came to Washington, carried some CVs, sat around a hotel room and pointed at Howard Hughes investigators, just passing around CVs. Oh yes, uh, he looks pretty good. Take him and take him. Well, that's the way I got Herbert Boyer appointed and developed uh, recombinant DNA just by passing a CV around. So we appointed some very good people that way. Now, speaking of George Thorne, what mm -hmm. sort of 
things did you learn from him as a mentor that you passed on um, as a mentor yourself to trainees? George Thorne was a uh, wonderful human being. It's very interesting. He came from the University of Buffalo and um, applied to the Brigham for an internship, and they wouldn't even interview him. He arrived about eight years later as the Hershey professor and chief of medicine at the, at the Brigham. He um, was full of ideas. He was never content with the status quo. He was always throwing out new ideas, most of them wrong, but at least, it, well, he would admit it too. The idea is not that you have to be right every time, but you thinking. And uh, he was always for progress. And so he um, was also a gentleman. He never took things personally. There was none of this um, academic infighting. He was a true gentleman, a visionary, and, a, and a, an excellent physician. And he was very um, interested in his young people in, in their subsequent careers. I really got on the Hughes thing because of George Thorne. And I, in fact, I'd worked with him as a student. Now, what advice do you have for trainees? What have you taught your own trainees, or what advice would you give to people to have a successful academic medical career? I'm not sure I ever just sat them down and gave anyone advice. <laughs> you try to set a standard. Uh, you try to uh, do, do things in your own career that they think might be useful to follow. Um, be, <clears throat> well, some of the things that I thought about when as, as uh, chairman, um, never attribute to malice what you can attribute to incompetence. Now that's a very important thing because uh, academic politics can get vicious, someone said, because the stakes are so low. But anyhow, incompetence is more frequent than malice. So you have a real way with words, and um, I compiled based on reading some of the things about <laughs> you, um, some of my most entertain the things that entertain me the most about your, your writing. Dress British, think Yiddish. You know, most of these things that are attributed to me, I picked up from other people and pass them on, you kind of gather them and over the years, and oh, I like that little thing. Uh, I didn't make these things up. You know. Okay, well, I think some of them you did, because one of them I lifted from your presidential address when you were ASCI president, which was, don't worry if you have to give an after cocktails or after dinner talk. A third of the audience is just falling asleep, a third of the audience is just waking up, and a third is engaging in private fantasies that they wouldn't want to discuss with anyone. That, I'm not sure whether I made it up or not, but I've, I've known it for years. Yeah, but they actually said private sexual fantasies. But anyhow, <laughs> I'd let that out of that. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, a quick last question. Yes. What do you think you would do if you were not an MD or a scientist? Um, that's a very interesting. I've never thought of any other career. Because you've been so dedicated to the one you've I've been had. dedicated to it. I've been happy in it. it uh, medicine has so many outflow pathways, all the way from public health to science to patient care, as, as you well know, that I think it's extraordinarily open for any versatile versatility that one has. I suppose I would have been a lawyer or something, but um, in a small southern town, you always thought, just thought mostly of the professions if you were middle class. But you've been happy with your career? I've been very happy with it. You can look back and think about the things that you missed here and there, and things you did, and, but in, in general, it's been very fulfilling, and I'm very proud of UCSF. It's a great institution. Mm -hmm.